It's safe to say that Electronic Arts has had a, a pretty checkered history. While the gaming giant is rightfully viewed with disdain nowadays, the company started out with surprisingly noble roots. EA was often praised for promoting its developers with artistic flair, while sharing its profits from games directly with them. At least according to this sketchy, unsourced giant bomb article. A lot of the titles which the business developed and or published in its earlier days went on to become beloved in the eyes of many. Franchises like The Need for Speed, Madden, FIFA, Ultima Online, and of course one-on-one, -on -one, Dr. J vs. Larry Bird. As time went on, EA began its slow but sure acquisition of any perceived talent in the gaming space that was for sale, adding to its already massive presence in the industry. In 1998, the company decided to start up another branch known as EA Redwood Shores. Initially, Redwood's entire job was to continue well-established franchises such as Tiger Woods PGA Tour, a handful of 007 games, several Sims 2 expansions, and so on. In the background, however, Redwood's vice president was trying to get EA's executives to fund their idea for System Shock 3. As the negotiations were tossed back and forth between the groups, Resident Evil 4 hit the market and completely shifted the way that both Redwood and EA viewed horror games. The green light was given to Redwood to pursue their new idea which was originally titled Rancid Moon, before leading to its final title of Dead Space. Dead Space was everything that EA seemed to be afraid to do. It was a horror game, the first developed by the company. It was an entirely new IP which EA had been afraid of creating for a while now, instead focusing on established franchises. Its overall visual style had never been seen in any horror game. It was pitched in a manner that was completely alien to EA's practices at the time, with the Redwood Studio focusing on getting a playable demo into their boss's hands rather than spending all of their efforts on design as was the norm at the time. The end result was a smashing success which led to Redwood Shore's rebranding to Visceral Games in 2009. I was 16 when Dead Space hit the shelves in October 14 years ago. Horror games weren't really, uh, my thing at the time, but the hype around Dead Space got me interested in the game regardless. Eventually I decided to rent it, which prompted me to play for, eh, 20 or 30 minutes at a time through the first four chapters or so before returning it. Yeah, I, um, wasn't built for horror at the time. But the thing is, the game stuck with me for a long while after. Every time it was brought up or I happened to think about it, there was some kind of staying power that made me want to go back for more. And eventually I did when Dead Space 2 dropped in 2011. And what I discovered was a rich, gripping, and action-packed game that only made me want to continue to enjoy this series. Well, until Dead Space 3 came out, then I just kind of, um, stopped returning to the series for a while. But now that the remake is around the corner, I figured that now was the time to give this game one last hard look to see if it really held up the way that I think that it does. So in this video, I'll be revisiting Dead Space and evaluating its story, level design, and mechanics while pointing out what I think it did well and what could have been done better. Before I begin, I'll note that I have some limited time merch for this video that will stick around until November 15th. I drew the helmet, my wife drew the portrait. Feel free to check it out if you're interested in that. I also have a sponsor with Factor that will appear around 30 minutes into the video, so try not to be too alarmed. Oh, and also, I don't normally say stuff like this, but, um... This game is very gory. If that bothers you, maybe just stick to audio. Alright, let's start. So I'm gonna get this one out of the way now. Dead Space's baseline story isn't anything unique by any means. The year is 2508, and a big-ass planet mining ship known as the USG Ishimura sent out a distress signal before its communications went dark. You're playing the role of Isaac Clark, an engineer who went to repair the Ishimura along with a few other specialists. Upon making it to the ship, it appears that the entire thing has lost power. I always found this interesting because the entire premise is that this planet cracker sent out a distress signal, and the company that it's affiliated with decided, eh, probably just needs some maintenance. I know that this could be considered the routine response, but it seems especially weird given that Isaac has received a message from his girlfriend who was aboard the ship as a medical specialist. The message itself, of course, doesn't say, oh god, oh fuck, there are aliens everywhere, holy shit, help. Because, I mean, then you'd have to really wonder what the company was thinking sending out five people to help. But the message does still have Isaac's girlfriend, Nicole, telling him that she can't believe that this is happening, which you would think would raise a little bit more concern. And the plot twist revolving around this message that comes at the very end of the game is, um, even more so concerning, but, you know, whatever. It's the setup. 
So upon trying to dock at the Ishimura, the crew gets hit by a stray bit of debris, knocking their auto-docking procedure off course and causing them to have to make an emergency landing. Like I said, it's a very by-the-book start that's reminiscent of a half a dozen setups for many classic horror films, but it does get you right in the action. After getting situated, your boss sends you in alone to get the air filtration working, which leads to these two unimportant people getting got by these bad boys. Welcome to Dead Space. Here's your main enemy type, the Necromorph. Well, specifically the Slasher. Ever since I first played this game, I can't help but go stand near the exit at this point, even if I'm not in any direct danger as long as I move. The devs thought that the best way to really kick things off is to scare the living hell out of the currently defenseless player. And while this can't just be described as an auto-scroller, it's a really fucking scary one. So after getting a look at one of these things up close when it tries to bust into your elevator, you're introduced to your first and possibly best weapon depending on who you ask. The plasma cutter is a former mining tool that utilizes three guiding lasers to accurately slice through whatever softer material you might be looking at. In this case, flesh. As the hastily scrawled message indicates, the necromorphs are particularly susceptible to limb damage, which is Dead Space's calling card. Where most games in the genre have you relying on headshots to safely navigate through them, Dead Space's enemies won't go down until you chop them into tiny pieces. It's a really simple concept on the surface, but this shit blew my teenage mind and took me a while to get used to during my first time playing. Your second weapon is something that Isaac already had, but didn't think to use until he got the plasma cutter. I fucking love stomping in this game. It just feels like you're taking out Isaac's fear and frustration in a fit of explosive action. So after making it over to the first safe area of the game, you're contacted by the other two who made it through the Horde. The objective now is to get to the bridge of the ship, for which you need to get the tram system up and running. We might as well talk about this now, but in addition to a lot of other firsts that Dead Space brought to the horror genre or maybe even to video games in general, the HUD is one of the smartest designs I've ever seen out of any video game. It's not that there is no HUD, it's that it's seamlessly integrated into the game in a way that's both obvious and immersive. There isn't a number with ammo in the corner of your screen. You have to look at your weapon's interface to note that. Your life bar is decorating Isaac's spine at all times, and changes hues depending on how fucked up he is. Later on, another gauge is placed to the right after gaining access to a particular power-up. Your map and waypoint guidance system is something that you have to pull up in real time. Accessing save points has you using a terminal. It's all so damn immersive, and it really ties you to the Ishimura in a way that few other games later on seem to draw inspiration from. The first chapter of the game and its goal of getting the tram system running showcases exactly what this game is going to be about, and it does so expertly. Necromorphs pop out of vents, loom in the distance, and hide in plain sight while pretending to be dead bodies, which will never catch you off guard after the first time that it happens to you. For a game to be able to fundamentally change how I play it even 14 years later should really tell you something, and I can't help but applaud how well everything is implemented. It's actually one of the only horror games that I've ever played where I'm armed to the teeth but still get creeped out or outright scared depending on the situation, which is something that I've always praised this game for. I know that everyone is different, but I've always been much more scared in a game when I'm weaponless and have no way of defending myself. As soon as you give me a weapon, anything that's capable of scaring me is just minimized more or less. But this game has always been the counter to that rule. Yeah, sure, I can kill these things, but if one gets too close, it's time to fucking make some distance fast. Of course, what would a horror game be without good sound design? And this game absolutely crushes its audio experience. Looming mechanical ambient noise suddenly gets jolted out of existence by high-pitched whining strings when a necromorph attacks. Every squeaking, scraping, and crunching noise has you looking around to make sure that you're not being followed. Random steam vents explode, rusty doors whine, Isaac's lonely footsteps thump away in his pseudo Big Daddy suit. All of it is just masterfully done. Nothing feels out of place, and everything adds to the cinematic feel of this game. I usually don't comment too much on audio design, but Dead Space really wouldn't be the same if there was something like a constantly driving synth-laden soundtrack or your stereotypical action game theme humming along in the background. As you traverse through the first area, you pick up several audio logs from various ship personnel who met their demise or figured out what these monsters are weak to. 
You also find one of your main power-ups for the game, the Stasis Module. This was that upgrade that I mentioned earlier, and its entire purpose is to slow shit down. Obviously, enemies that are moving much too fast for your liking are countered by it. But more importantly, obstacles are immediately put into play that require you to slow them down or risk dismemberment. The occasional puzzle is thrown at you also, but when the problem is that something is moving way too goddamn fast, the answer is pretty obvious. Near the end of your tram repair foray, you find an upgrade bench with a trail of gore leading past it and into a vent. This kind of environmental storytelling not only paints an array of possibilities as to what happened into your mind, it also immediately puts you on guard. And the funny thing is that nothing happens in this room. It's completely safe. Nothing bursts out of the vent or comes in through the door behind you, but the entire time you're just thinking, well, what if? The bench itself is where you go to upgrade your equipment with power nodes that are found throughout your journey. Each bit of equipment has a tree that you can navigate to upgrade your gear. Your plasma cutter can have its damage, ammo capacity, reload speed, and shooting speed upgraded. Your suit can be upgraded so that you can raise your health and air capacity when you're in places without oxygen. And your stasis module can have its duration increased and its energy use reduced. But I never gave a shit about that one. Obviously, later upgrades and weapons have their own trees, but you get the point. Basically, this game does something that a lot of others don't really tend to do, which is laying out most of your capabilities almost immediately. It's an interesting way to approach your game, because everything new that I have to look forward to from here on out is almost always a weapon. You don't gain access to benches for the first time at the end of Chapter 2, or gain your stasis module in the middle of Chapter 4. You just get almost everything that you'll need right away. Speaking of, a couple of your weapons can be bought immediately if you happen to pick up enough credits during your tram excursion. At the end of the chapter is a shop where you can trade in credits for consumables, armor, and weapons. Armor tends to be the most important to me since it means more inventory slots and damage resistance. But the second thing that I always pick up is the line gun. This is another fantastic weapon that you acquire almost immediately in this game. And while the shots are slower, the power is immense right out the gate when compared to your cutter. After getting the tram up and running, our last big upgrade comes in the form of the second and final module that we're going to be getting in the game, the Kinesis Module. As you might expect, it allows us to force pick up, move, and throw objects at our leisure. Great for chunking an explosive into a group of enemies or for just shuffling boxes around. Chapter 2's design is well done and feels much more like a tight level packed with encounters over Chapter 1's introduction. Our objective this time around is getting to the captain's body so that we can use his identification to access the ship's systems. At this stage, the two other people that Isaac has been communicating with were attacked, with the technologist Kendra going missing. Our boss Hammond continues to give Isaac instructions, with the hope that a cooler head will guide us through this shit show. As you progress through the medbay, it becomes pretty apparent that the layout for this level is very intentional. You head into the main area, fight some monsters, head through a zone with an array of baby tubes, fall through the map when trying to take an elevator, grab some thermite to blow open a sealed area, and then follow the room back into the first room that you fought in, forming a pretty nice loop that makes you feel good about exploring. This kind of design comes up pretty frequently throughout the game, and hardly ever makes you feel lost, which is awesome. I won't describe every time that it does it, but I thought this was a pretty solid example that was worth mentioning. The big things to note are a new enemy type in the form of these transformed babies called Lurkers. These guys rely on ranged combat, but can still rake at and jump at you with their three long tendrils if you get too close. Still pretty basic so far, but ultimately a pretty creepy idea regardless. The rest of the level has you using your kinesis to shift the environment around a bit to progress while also giving you your first taste of rooms that are in a vacuum and zero-g environments. Like I said, this game moves fast and doesn't hesitate to throw new ideas at you, and that becomes abundantly clear the further that you make it. The vacuum areas are awesome in that the usual music and sound effect cues to indicate that you're in combat or being tracked are gone. Sound is minimal with only Isaac's muffled breathing and reverberations of his weapons to keep him company. After getting used to what this game sounds like, it's a jarring twist to keep things fresh. The zero gravity rooms are also really fun, and have you making use of your suit's gravity boots to jump from one part of the room to the other. One of the best things that Dead Space does is taking those moments of blocked passage from Metroidvanias and just letting you do them immediately. Whereas a game like Metroid might have you encountering a set of tiles that denote an upgrade that you clearly don't have, Dead Space tends to go, oh, a zero G room? Here's some gravity boots, fam, go nuts. I mean, sure, they could have made part of this level about gaining this upgrade, 
but the devs wanted you to go, 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 and that's definitely an option that you have if you want to sprint through these levels instead of crawling. But even all of these additions aren't enough for Chapter 2, as you encounter yet another minor enemy type in these tiny necromorphs called Swarmers. Appearance-wise, they're these small chunks of animated flesh that crawl towards and latch onto Isaac, forcing him to have to shake them off. This is one of the few enemies in the game where the plasma cutter isn't a very good option, which leads us to our next weapon that I pick up, the pulse rifle. As you might expect, this is your stereotypical machine gun of the game, which you can use to tip the mechanics back towards what you'd expect. Aim at the center of mass and fire. I really like the pulse rifle for big moments, which you'll probably see a lot of throughout my playthrough. I also find it to be a lot more useful than the flamethrower in this game, though the flamethrower does get a buff in Dead Space 2. After thermiting the thermite wall, it's time to go shake the captain's body around for its lunch money. Throughout this chapter, there have been the occasional logs referencing something known as the Marker, which I'm going to get into in much greater detail later on. For now, the basics are as follows. There was a thing known as the Marker on the planet which this ship is orbiting, and since finding it, around 40% of the workforce here have suffered from mental lapses, causing them to exhibit symptoms ranging from a lack of sleep to full-on psychotic breaks. This is showcased in a room where a medical worker seems to be tormenting a live victim before killing both them and herself. There's one last new enemy shown off in Chapter 2, and it's got to be one of my favorites from a sheer creepiness factor. That would be the Infector. These are these flying monsters that are created from a human's legs and torso. Their primary function is to, well, infect. Any intact bodies are susceptible to the Infector's process which involves them wrapping their wing-like bodies around a corpse, cracking their skull open like an egg with a long, sharp tendril, and filling them to the brim with delicious piss. The pissification morphs your standard human body into a slasher, making Isaac's priority to take them out ASAP or to risk being overrun. But more importantly for me personally, these particular creatures make me again play this game differently than I was. Before this, if a body was definitely human, I wouldn't stomp them. I mean, come on, that's gross, dude. But now you've got something that can literally turn unmorphed bodies into more enemies. So stomping a human body might seem needlessly brutal and fucked up, but this game basically takes that sensation and turns it into a survival thing. If I have to stomp them to survive, then that's what I have to do. And that's a really fucking cool bit of psychological horror that's heaped onto an already massive pile of horror. Chapter 3's goal is to get the fuel reconnected to the ship along with re-enabling its gravity field so that we don't tumble into the planet. This has us crossing a huge chasm on a gondola, taking on slashers in a darkened decontamination chamber, and reconnecting the centrifuge which creates a wall of death afterward. I really like the added danger of the last one, and the only thing that kept me alive here was my experience. Basically, this gigantic spinning chunk of metal will one-shot you if you happen to stand in its path. The issue here is that the devs throw in a couple of slashers at you in parts of the safe zone. In the past, I've definitely backed away from the monsters to try to kill them, resulting in the metal wall just blowing me away. This time, I knew to stick close to them even if it meant them grabbing me, because I could survive that. On the way back, a big-ass tentacle grabs you and starts dragging you towards one of the holes in the wall, which is something that a lot of people know about that haven't even played this game. The build-up to this one is great, because there are these very obvious holes in the infrastructure of a few hallways in Chapter 2, but nothing comes out of them at all. So when you see them in 3, you're like, huh, I wonder what that is, but eh, I guess nothing happened with them before. I know it seems silly, but playing with a controller and sticking to the plasma cutter before had me dying to this thing a couple of times. But it actually dies comically fast if you pull the pulse rifle on it and can aim. The whole tentacle sequence actually nearly halted the game's development progress entirely just because it took so much specific planning and coding. And while I knew that it was coming and planned for it this time around, the first time? Yeah, that shit was fucking terrifying. And including it for just a handful of little moments really shows how much love was folded into this game. There is one more new enemy type that will appear more frequently, though, which shows up near the end of the chapter. I kind of blasted it before it could do anything, but it's basically this fat slasher which is appropriately called a pregnant. As you might imagine, if you happen to do a little too much damage to this thing's torso, a load of swarmers will shoot out of it, though sometimes you get shit like lurkers as well. I know it doesn't have the most inspired name, but to be fair, neither do most of these. Slashers slash, lurkers lurk, pregnants preg. I do like that you can avoid the ensuing swarmers if you avoid the belly, though, which adds a bit more difficulty to combat when a pregnant is involved. 
In terms of new weaponry, we've got the Ripper, which is a remote-controlled saw blade that shoots out and sticks around for a while. It's a really fun weapon, but I never found it worth using until I sunk some points of damage into it personally. Throughout Chapter 3, more allusions are made towards this marker driving people crazy on the ship, though there still isn't any concrete answer surrounding it. The more pertinent thing is that Kendra has now made it to safety and is working with Hammond again, and Isaac's girlfriend seems to be dropping direct messages to him to ask where he is. It's worth noting that Isaac doesn't have a voice in this game, so he doesn't really reply to her or anyone else. But that's all that really happens in terms of the overarching plot right now. The next pressing matter is the fact that trying to get the ship into a geoplanetary orbit is only going to have us ramming into the debris kicked up from the planet crack. Normally, the asteroid defense systems would take care of this, but as with everything else, they're offline. So that'll be our Chapter 4 objective. The name of the game in this chapter is Brutes. These are more or less mini-bosses which are heavily armored amalgamations of flesh. Shooting them in the front does no damage besides, um, in their armpits. But when you do cause enough damage to them in the front, the Brutes hunker down so that you have to cross behind them to get shots on their exposed backs. These things are fucking awful when in a group and in small tight spaces, but thankfully not so bad alone. I'd say that upgrading to my next armor rig helped, but uh, it didn't really touch me. The plot is now starting to pick up the pace at this stage, as Kendra outright accuses Hammond of knowing about the marker while Hammond denies her claims. Logs continue to paint a picture of madness, one of which showcases the captain of the ship going insane before being arrested for violating maritime law before a doctor sticks the captain with a sedative. Now the issue here is that the sedative's needle was administered directly into the captain's eye and through his frontal lobe, which definitely sedated him to be fair. The doctor claims that he didn't mean to kill the captain, but with the amount of craziness pouring from this place, it's hard to believe that the guy didn't just snap. Oh, and also this happens. Yeah, thanks, I didn't need my ears. Yeah, the whole bit with Isaac's girlfriend Nicole is definitely starting to get weirder, as she's now appearing on monitors and the like. Since Isaac is still mute, the obvious conclusion is that he's starting to be affected by whatever madness is going on here. But the full truth is something that we'll get to later down the line. The mix-up with the mechanics here involve these anti-gravity vents that are wonderfully showcased by one of these slashers here. It's again another mechanic that takes the natural movement of the player to get away from enemies and forces them to either maneuver more carefully or to stand their ground at a closer range. There's another brute down here in that lovely close quarters spacing that I mentioned having difficulty with before, but it's also alone, so it's not that big of an issue. After getting yet more power rerouted to where it needs to go, the next section has us crossing a part of the ship to get to where the asteroid destroying cannon is. This is followed up by Isaac needing to take over control of the cannon to manually shoot down the asteroids as they fly in towards the ship. You heard that right. We literally got a cover shooter section followed by a turret section, which is appropriate for this game's release year. But that said, Dead Space is probably one of the best games for something like this to exist in. I'm not saying that Isaac should be able to jump on a turret in every level and just start blowing away waves of necromorphs, but the context here makes all of this okay for me, right? There's a good reason beyond the devs going, oh yeah, we should uh, have this in here, like it was a checklist requirement. And the idea that the ship will literally explode if I fail or that I'll get battered into mush if I don't stay in cover makes the stakes high enough for me to not care as much about these mechanics that were a staple of this era of gaming. Our new weapons for this chapter include the contact beam and the force gun. The contact beam is basically our BFG of the game for a lack of a better comparison. It's something that you tend to pull out during big fights against heavier enemies, as its damage is insane when compared to every other weapon. Just to clarify, my fully upgraded damage plasma cutter does 18 damage a shot, but the contact beam's base damage does 100 a shot. The downside is that you have to charge it up in order to fire it, which isn't good when you're being swarmed. Still, it is a pretty fun weapon overall. The force gun, on the other hand, is your shotgun of the game. Great when you're getting swarmed and have no room to back up, basically. A lot of Dead Space's arsenal is up to personal preference, but my go-to setup has always been the cutter, the line gun, the force gun, and either the contact beam or the pulse rifle. Still, there really are no wrong answers besides the flamethrower, at least in this game. 
So chapter four ends with yet another objective that has to do with us getting the ship not to piss and shit itself on us. This isn't really a bad thing as it kind of makes sense that this place is gonna be woefully damaged with what it's been through. Still, hearing that the oxygen is now failing or outright being poisoned by the goop is one of those things that makes you roll your eyes after you've gone through all of the maintenance that you've been through already. I guess you are the engineer, so at least you're doing what you signed up for, uh, kind of. Chapter five actually kicks off in the same location as chapter two, but with a few differences in enemy types and the like. For one, we encounter our first guardian, which, um, yeah, it, it, uh, it guards. It's basically formed from a human body fusing with the corrupting goop that the necromorphs seem to come from. They're super dangerous up close, but not too bad from mid-range. The worst that they can really do from this distance is shoot out another necromorph subtype known as a pod, which will then begin shooting projectiles Isaac's way. As you make it to the area where you synthesize a poison to destroy the corruption, one of the doctors who went crazy and began experimenting on live human patients reveals himself to you. He views the necromorphs as the race that will succeed human life, taking on an almost paternal view of this whole ordeal. His child, so to speak, is this thing that's looming in the tube behind you, which looks like a chunkier slasher. This is the Hunter, which definitely takes a direct inspiration from the Resident Evil series. There's only one in the entire game and its capabilities include slowly walking at you while regenerating its limbs when shot off. Basically, this thing is a Resident Evil 4 regenerator mixed with Resident Evil 2's Mr. X or 3's Nemesis. It can't be killed yet and it's going to show up for another chapter near the end of the game. I'm not the biggest fan of it because I always felt that even Resident Evil shouldn't have repeated its Mr. X idea in the next game, but I do admit that it is pretty damn jarring to be stuck in a room with, so I guess that was the point. This whole chapter is pretty damn short in comparison to the last couple, as the doctor winds up cutting off the oxygen at one point, and then sicks his hunter on you in a room with a big fuck off cryostasis pod in the center of it. The feeding the hunter for now means chopping off some limbs, hitting it with stasis or a combination of the two, and then running over and activating the cryopod to Han Solo it before moving on to the next chapter. Chapter 6 still has you attempting to clean the air, though our tour guide now is effectively Kendra, seeing as Hammond seems to have gotten fucked up by the corruption. Fortunately, our guy is still alive in the hydroponic section of the map, where he's tracked down the source of the poison spreading into the oxygen. This is a bit of a cleanup mission, as your task is to destroy these necromorphs which are creating the poison and spreading it around. The level feels a lot different just due to all of the plant life that's around, which is definitely welcome after all of the gray and brown that we've slogged through to get to this stage. The level itself is a bit of a confusing maze at times when you hit a couple of zero-g sections, but it's still pretty fun in and of itself. I have to say, I never really mentioned this too much before, but the navigation system in this game is stellar. It's actually kind of crazy how well done it is for 2008. There were points during this hunt where I just had no fucking clue as to where to go but the waypoint system was always ready to help out with sharp and efficient angles. I know the mere concept of a glowing trail isn't new, but I love the flavor of the implementation. I'll admit it now, I'm a slave to event markers and glowing trails. If they're always on, I'm almost always just going to blindly follow them instead of exploring for myself. I know they have a place in a lot of games, but I can't help but to think how different this game would be if there was always some diamond on screen pointing out where I needed to go next. The new enemy type here are the suicide bomber type of necromorphs called Exploders. Alright, yeah, I probably would have named them that too, honestly. Shooting them in the big glowy bits makes them detonate, and if you think that's not gonna get annoying, then you're in for a treat in the later levels. As always, the initial showcase just warms you up to the idea of them rather than mixing them in immediately with other necromorphs, so they're nothing that we need to worry about now. It is worth noting that the ghost of Nicole has continued to hound Isaac, and Kendra's now seeing her brother appear on the monitors of the station as well, further pointing to this place starting to worm its way slowly into the squad's brains. So after hunting down these sad sacks of shit and getting dragged by another tentacle, it's time to stop the corruption from continuing to spread. This has us navigating what I imagine the inside of a first edition fleshlight looks like before entering our first big boss fight of the game. This big gnarly thing is the Leviathan, and it's the reason for the air becoming so fucked up. The fight itself is pretty fun, though very gamey as you might expect. When a dev decides to put big glowing weak spots on some of the enemies, it takes away a lot of the novelty of figuring out a fight for yourself. But I don't really mind it in all honesty. 
Because of this design though, there really isn't too much more to say about the fight itself. After shoving most of my ammo down its maw, it's time to finally attempt to start flagging down help. Though I have to imagine that a corporation would notice one of their gargantuan, planet-cracking ships going missing. So it's hard to say what good launching an SOS would do. Alright, before I roll into Chapter 7, let's take a moment to hop over to my sponsor for this video, Factor. So every here and there, you happen upon someone who just can't cook for the life of them. I mean, not me, I'm great at cooking. But sometimes I'm lazy. Sometimes I just don't feel like trying to whip up a perfect six-star meal and instead wind up opting for ordering takeout or popping some dino nuggies into the oven. This is where Factor comes in to mitigate some of my, uh, less healthy decisions. Factor delivers meals to your doorstep that are ready to eat in two minutes or less, which takes any excuse of laziness that I may have and turns it on its head. If you're watching your weight or following a specific diet plan, Factor helps to take the guesswork out of what to make for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. It's basically like having a load of MREs, except the MREs were made with the satisfaction of someone's taste buds in mind. So if any of this sounds like something you could get on board with, feel free to use my link or go to go.factor75.com and use code POGTSF60 for 60% off your first box. Thanks, guys. Chapter 7 is where the game takes a turn design-wise. We're done seeing a guaranteed new monster every level, and all of the mechanics are more or less set in stone at this point. The devs also decided that you're ready for more, and that means that they're just gonna start dropping enemies on your head, and that it's not just gonna be one or two enemies in a room, it's gonna be waves of them. We're starting to go from slowly creeping from one room to another to just blasting non-stop, at least when compared to before. I could see people saying that this is a little too much, and that the game is more action-focused at this stage, but to me, it's kind of a cool way to show off just how far that we've come, while figuring out the optimal way to approach mixed waves. Pregnants should be taken out first, if possible, but you also gotta watch out for exploders. Any swarmers that pop out of them become a huge priority because too many of those will just kill you. Lurkers and slashers are annoying, but they're kinda secondary. This kind of combat priority lends a lot more strategic value to your playstyle, and while I'm sure that you could just mindlessly shoot the waves of monsters shambling at you, you're gonna need a lot more medkits to get through the game. As far as the story stuff goes, we have no idea what happened to Hammond after the hydroponics ordeal. Our plan is to take an asteroid that's being held in one of the mining areas and then rig it with an SOS beacon before launching it out into space. During the inevitable runaround that Isaac is subjected to, he actually finds Nicole in person, or at least a very convincing mirage of her. She talks to him, tells him that she loves him, and opens the door for him while he continues to not speak. During this door opening sequence, you're assigned with protecting her, though she doesn't seem to notice or care about the slashers bearing down on her in the slightest. After upgrading my suit again, it's time to send the SOS rock out. This is one of those moments that really stuck with me just because of how cool this little puzzle wound up being. So basically, you've got this big ass rock, right? And your initial reaction is, all right, well, I'll just uh, slow the gyrators down and plant the beacon. But that wouldn't make sense, right? The gyrators would sweep the beacon clean off the thing like they just did to you. So what you gotta do is spring to the edge, walk outside, destroy the tethers, plant the beacon, run back in, and destroy the tethers on the inside. Pretty cool, huh? It basically takes all of the puzzles before this, which tended to be about just slowing something down, and hits you with an aha moment. Because the devs could have made it so that you couldn't slow the gyrators down but they decided to let you just brainlessly do it because that's what they've conditioned you to do. Taking the time to think it through makes the solution a bit more obvious, and it really made me laugh when I figured it out the first time. After all of this is done, another part of the ship is broken. The twists just keep coming, huh? Yeah, we send this thing out, but we can't receive a signal back because the comms array is busted. That'll be our chapter eight. During our drudge over to the comms, we find out from an audio log that it was actually the captain of the ship that had the comms disabled, and that the Ishimura was here in a prohibited part of space to conduct this operation. After gingerly whipping around some delicate satellite dishes, our comms work, and we receive a message from a nearby ship who claims to have received one of our escape pods. Yeah, that would be a pod that Hammond decided to launch earlier containing a slasher. Hell yeah, brother. If you think that repairing the comms array means that our comms work, think again. 
Our signal isn't strong enough due to some sort of giant organic blockage, which will have to blow out using one of these ship's cannons. Fortunately, this isn't one of those things where I have to clear out two floors and instead the cannon's right next to where I'm at. The ensuing mini boss has us firing at the tentacles while it just throws shit at us, which is okay, I guess. It's just kind of there. There's no strong feelings one way or another about this fight. Unfortunately, our boost comes a little too late, and the rescue ship also gets taken out by the now onboard necromorphs. Then it crashes into us. It's about this time when Hammond decides, you know what, fuck this shit. Let's get out of this damn place. I guess nearly dying twice will do that to a man, though Isaac seems to be all right with just hanging out and fixing things. It's actually something that I have a bit of a gripe with because while playing a silent protagonist helps you fill them in with yourself, it doesn't work as well when you have his mind being filled with imagery of his girlfriend constantly and his coworkers freaking out while ordering him around. And the longer this goes on, the more it's like, well, why isn't Isaac talking? I go from putting myself in his shoes to wondering what the fuck the man is thinking while he continues to mindlessly tread through hellfire. Regardless, we're now officially trying to just leave the ship instead of saving it, which brings us to chapter nine. Interestingly enough, eight is probably the fastest chapter of the game, with very few encounters and objectives, especially when compared to the previous chapter. There is a new necromorph called the Divider, which comes close to taking the cake for sheer creepiness in my opinion. These are these very long, thin, shambling zombie types, which then split or divide into these little strange tentacle creatures. If you happen to die to the head part of this division, the head will decapitate Isaac and then insert its tendrils down his neck hole, effectively gaining a new body to pilot. It's fucking horrific. And I love how the devs continue to innovate on what these necromorphs can be. Chapter nine is the beginning of our great escape, which kicks off with the knowledge from Hammond that the ship that happened to be here to respond to our distress call was on a seek and destroy mission to obliterate the Ishimura. Let that sink in for a moment. The ship was sent by Earth's government to destroy the Ishimura. This means that these dumbasses captured a life pod and opened it while knowing that the ship was meant to be destroyed. Sure, maybe they didn't know that there was an alien life form inside the pod, but I imagine that a destroyer level vessel's men would be well equipped to deal with a single slasher. I imagine that Earth Defense Force soldiers would all have stasis modules and be armed to the teeth. They have a literal shooting range on their ship and their orders explicitly state that the Ishimura has extracted the marker, and that the marker must be returned to the planet to prevent further alien spread. And what's even funnier about this entire situation is that the slasher doesn't infect. It's the grunt of the necromorphs, the cannon fodder, meaning that one slasher dismantled the entire ship by itself, or at least the bridge crew who pilots the thing. Even though the fucking escape pod had a big ass glass window that you could see inside of. Unfortunately, it's one of those things that has to happen in the horror genre to keep it going. I mean, sure, you could suddenly have an outbreak of some chaotic, monstrous force, but there's always got to be a point where someone does something stupid in order to keep the horror rolling or suffer it going stale. I'm not a big fan of it stemming from this kind of fill in the blanks writing that encourages the viewer to stop thinking in order to fully enjoy it. But regardless, the ship that crashed into us has a singularity core that we need to power the shuttle to get out of here with. So that's our first order of business. The upside to this whole lack of logic is that it produces a fun new enemy type called the Twitcher, which has always been an enemy type in real life. Basically, the devs took the slasher and they said, all right, uh, but what if it was fast? Much like asking if Goku should hit the gritty, it's an answer that nobody likes or wants to deal with. And the end result has caused the bodies of the soldiers who had stasis modules to transform into quick-moving Sonic the Hedgehog deviant art OCs, but with somehow more vor. No, but for real, I fucking hate these things. They turn the mechanics I've learned up until this stage on their head and are liable to sneak up on me in the worst way when I'm not looking. Thankfully, they don't do much damage, but they're easily the number one source of scares for me in dead space. As far as the level itself goes, there's the whole shooting range thing, which has five levels and was definitely meant to be a challenge for controller users. As things stand, it's an easy task for me to make it through the five levels for a power node. There's also a little engine puzzle, though it's more of a simple mix of kinesis and shooting than a Rubik's Cube of puzzling. After nabbing the core, it's time to back on out of here. 
The problem is that the power for, uh, well, just this one part of the ship is now shut off. Fortunately, our good friend Hammond is here to bust the glass open for us. He's got a weird method of doing it, but uh, you definitely can't argue with the results since the way is definitely clear afterwards. For as often as I've remarked that someone figuratively gets their limbs ripped off and the like, I never thought I'd be saying it literally in one of these videos. He's fine. He'll be in the next one. After making it out of here, it's time to hit chapter 10. Though I do think that this is probably a good point to break down the background lore for these last three chapters. So let's flesh that out so that we have a bit more context beyond a mysterious marker and the like. So the entirety of Dead Space's setup is detailed in a short series of comics. This is actually something that I don't normally do, but this is an interesting case because the comics actually came out in the months before Dead Space did, from March 2008 to August 2008. The entire series denotes what exactly happened in the events leading up to this game, and I feel like they're important for the context here. So the basics are as follows. Humanity's been mining away in deep space for materials since Earths have been depleted. The planet that we're in orbit around is one that was said to be particularly rich in resources, which the trading company known as the CEC was contracted to mine. Just before the Ishimura arrived, the CEC's miners located an alien-looking rock which correlated directly with a religion known as Unitology, or so the Unitologists who practiced the religion thought. In their religion, which started a few hundred years back, a man stated that he found something known as a marker, which he thought to be the call of a higher power. The man was subsequently denounced as crazy by the government and killed in an accident, which his newfound followers believed to be the direct work of the government. Now this strange rock that was discovered is thought to be another one of the Unitologist's markers. As time went on, it became clear that the marker had some kind of mental indoctrination capability, as many of the miners began to hallucinate and were unable to sleep. These hallucinations tended to whisper to those afflicted, urging them to protect the marker. The religious zealots began holding sermons, claiming that they would soon become one with God due to the marker calling to them. In the background, one of the higher-ups in charge of the operation went against his boss's wishes and ordered that the marker be extracted by the Ishimura. As the thing's being pulled from the planet's crust, a load of zealots commit ritual suicide at the exact same time, and a lot of the rest of the miners began suffering from physical and mental illness. Additionally, now you just had this goop oozing from the various vents around the base's infrastructure, which some of the workers got to torching with flamethrowers. Of course, the higher-ups are all celebrating both the fact that the marker's been extracted and that the planet is now being actively cracked open by the gigantic ship which has arrived on scene. As the Ishimura begins ripping open the planet, all hell continues to break loose down on the surface. It's discovered by one of the scientists' planet side that the goop is a hostile alien life form that attacks a host, infects a dead body, and takes it over, rewriting its DNA to become the necromorphs which we've seen so many of by now. The bigger issue with this is the fact that the higher-ups wanted the bodies of the deceased miners, meaning that by the time the shuttles made it over to the Ishimura, those bodies would have mutated into more monsters. While this whole ordeal doesn't quite explain how this alien life form came to be or what exactly its goal is beyond reproduction, it does showcase the absolute chaotic evil which the necromorphs encompass, while setting up the game pretty well. The last panels detail the fact that these hostile creatures can survive in a vacuum and that their main nest became the leftover husk of a comms beacon on the surface of the planet. Again, if you look at the parts, none of this is particularly inspired to a point of a grand and intricate story. Though I do think that Unitology is a point of interest to dive deeper that shows up a lot more in Dead Space 2. Instead, most of Dead Space 1 is about this chaotically evil, mindless force of destruction and the people who are trying to deal with it, which I think is completely fine for a horror-themed game. Hell, my personal favorite horror movie is The Thing, which functions on basically the same premise. Let's get back to the game. Something I neglected to mention from before was that there was a point in Chapter 9 where Isaac gets a direct message from the doctor who killed the captain. He claims that the cultists who have amassed and prayed to the marker are all wrong, and that the marker must be returned to the planet, which he proposes that Isaac uses the shuttle for instead of escaping. Fast forward back to chapter 10 and we have the biggest shift in tone in this game so far. This is where I believe the Unitologists committed ritual suicide, as denoted by the wrapped corpses with holes in their heads. Ominous chanting, singing, and whispering fill the background, and the setting to this place is a lot more recreational. 
There's a lot of living quarters type spaces, in addition to a zero-g basketball court where you can play a few rounds up to level 6. I never fully grasped how many points that you need just because I tend to scramble around, but it's not too difficult of a little minigame. Making your way through the more residential area reveals a lore dump by a reporter type's text log, which unveils a lot of what we already know about Unitology. The interesting bit though is that it works in the same way that a lot of real world religions work. The more money and power that you can contribute to the church, the higher your rank. This means that many high-end CEOs and other powerful people are at the top of this thing. Additionally, while the whole thing is built around the idea that their god causing death will lead to rebirth, the more important thing is what happens after the death of a unitologist. To become a member of the inner circle, you have to sign away your corpse after you die, which the unitologists are speculated to use in the construction of something known as a mausoleum ship. This is something that unfortunately was never fully capitalized on as an idea due to Dead Space 3's transgressions. But all the same, it's a very interesting idea that I hope the remake pilots back towards. Anyways, you remember that doctor who went nuts and made the hunter? Yeah, he's back, and seems to be in the process of creating new holes in humans' heads for the necromorphs to infect. Now, my initial thought when seeing him do that was that maybe the corpses in the main entry to this place were the result of him jabbing them, but I don't see why he would take the time to wrap them up if the only goal was to infect them. So I still say that it was probably the ritual suicide, but there's no way to tell for sure. Unless I just missed something, in which case, my bad. Interestingly enough though, this whole process seems to denote a sort of intelligence in this alien life beyond the desire to kill and breed. I mean, this guy has just been running willy-nilly through loads of necromorphs, and they haven't killed him. So either they're directly controlling him, or he's evading them really well, or they realize that he's helping them, the latter of which is the much more interesting concept. Throughout this chapter, our goal is to get the shuttle up and running since its navigation bits have been stripped. Again, the level design here is some of my favorite in the game just because of how residential this setting is. A mess hall, rows of bunk beds, the basketball court, all of it is just so different from the very typical sci-fi ideas that we've encountered up until now. Of course, with the crazy doctor running around comes the hunter who's been thawed out. This is easily the most chaotic part of the game so far. As to get to this part of it, I had to move the bunk beds around with Kinesis, meaning that I need to do the same thing to get out. Of course, the doctor can remotely shut down my escape route also, leaving me stuck in a room with the thing and anything else that pops up with it. I tend to panic around this point, which is probably normal? Um, it's not so much that I can't hit my shots, it's more that I don't know which weapon to use and wind up dooming it with whatever weapon I happen to pull out. It's actually really fun, as even the save room isn't safe right after this. Eventually, the other doctor, Dr. Kine, calls me up to the executive suite to tell me about his plan to return the marker. He claims that the shuttle is way too damaged to get us safely out of here, and instead shows a brief video of what was unleashed from the planet when the marker was extracted we get a small glimpse at the giant mass of flesh known as the Hive Mind, which Dr. Kine claims is controlling the rest of the Necromorphs. I'll have more to say about that in a moment. So with the shuttle option looking less likely in terms of escape, the plan is to now follow Kine's orders, which he states will result in the marker sealing these things away again. Heading down to where the shuttle is has us installing the nav card and giving the shuttle a test fire. And golly, wouldn't you know it, the hunter is here. Fortunately, this is the last time we'll be seeing him, as the fight is the exact same as before, except this time with holy fire instead of ice. Kine waltzes up afterwards and goes, Hey, alright, good shit. Uh, I'm gonna take the shuttle, you can meet me ahead. On foot. I like the idea that there was no way that we could both take it, seeing as releasing the clamps has Kine staring at the door for a moment before slowly walking in. Oh well, might as well walk back to the tram. I just love that Kendra is like, all right, I guess we can go with his plan, but I don't know if we can trust him. You mean the guy who keeps talking to his dead wife mid-conversation? Yeah, he's probably fine. Meanwhile, Doctor 2 sends you a video of him willingly getting sucked down by an infector. So I guess the whole idea about the aliens knowing how useful he is is out. Or he just ran out of usefulness. I don't know what the fuck is going on here. The only other thing worth mentioning about Chapter 10 is that I did wind up getting our final armor upgrade which looks pretty cool as always. There is one more set of armor that could be unlocked in New Game Plus that looks a lot different, but I never really liked it as much as the previous sets. The rusty metal look was always the more iconic one for me. 
And even though it was technically supposed to be regular engineer or minor gear, it felt a lot more unique than the soldier rig that Isaac can tout after beating the game once. Onward to the second to last chapter. The first thing that we gotta do is load the marker from the holding area up to the shuttle. If you're like me, you forget about the tentacles. But it kinda works out because they also smash the horde of necromorphs that charge you down. I called this part of the game, how much ammo do you got? Because you'll cut it in half by the time you're done with it. Then again, nearly every enemy drops ammo too, so it's not like I don't gain it back by the end. So after getting back over to the loading bay and escorting this thing along the track, it's time for the big betrayal. Yep, Dr. Kine is... Hurry! There's no time to waste, we must do it! Sorry, Isaac. I couldn't let him go through with it. I suppose I should thank you for finding the marker. We even managed without help from the USM Valor. Yeah, this one really chapped my ass back in the day. Kendra's not a unitologist, but she is a covert agent for EarthGov. You see, the marker is a manufactured relic created by the government after they discovered a real one back in the day. And now they want it back, for some reason. This is actually all of the information that you get out of this game concerning the markers, as much more of the mystery is revealed through an animated film that dropped the same day as Dead Space 2 did. Of course, both sequels also flesh out these ideas more, in addition to a novel that was released between 2 and 3. I'm gonna do something here to save a handful of people who might have just played the first game but haven't made it to 2 or 3 yet, and give an elusive spoiler warning for the next chunk of this video. I'm gonna be talking about some stuff that comes after this game and basically talking about why this game's plot is a little flawed due to retcon. So skip ahead to the time on screen if you want to be saved there. Alright. To shed a little light on this whole thing instead of leaving it here, the markers are what basically create necromorphs. And this is kind of the issue with Dead Space 1's plot, or maybe it's the issue with everything else after it. It feels like these guys initially wanted to go with a whole, hey, the markers are uh, here to seal away an ancient alien evil, which is only further backed by Kind's theories about returning the marker and claiming that the hive mind is the brains of the operation. But later on, it turns out to all be the doing of the marker. It emits a frequency that not only affects humans' minds, but reanimates dead cells into the monsters that we've seen for the entire game. And it's the whole reason for all of this happening the way that it did. And you could justify parts of it by saying that Kine just didn't know what he was dealing with and was taking his best guess. But when Isaac is voiceless, it's very hard to not accept what other characters are telling you as fact. Yes, they can lie, but that lie needs to be made apparent by the game, like it was with Kendra. At the time of release, Dead Space seemed to be aimed more towards humanity's efforts to seal alien life away. And you'll see this more in a moment at the game's conclusion. For now and for future entries, what you need to know is that this whole thing turns out to be an almost holy war between EarthGov and the Unitologists. The markers were meant to control people, turned out to be a little too much, and were fired off into space at random areas of it. Those areas were then prohibited from being entered but the Unitologists wormed their way into the ears of the CEC, claiming that there was a planet in forbidden space with bountiful resources. Then they infiltrated the operation with the express purpose of stealing away the marker. The only bit that I've never fully understood myself is the reason why EarthGov would want the marker back according to Kendra, but I feel like that's more my own misunderstanding of a retconned plot rather than the answer not being there. If someone wants to shed some light on that, please feel free. Alright, where were we? Oh yeah, Isaac's fucked. So might as well give in to the visions at this stage and listen to Nicole, who pops back into Isaac's feed to tell him to meet up with her. Now fortunately, the technologist, Kendra, seemed to forget that these shuttles had a recall function to just pull them back to the Ishimura. Whoops. She throws a bitch fit before jumping onto the escape pod and launching herself onto the planet. Hey, that's where we're going. Isaac and Nicole hop aboard the shuttle and pilot it to the planet, bringing us to our final chapter. This planet has oxygen. Huh, I didn't think about that before. But Isaac can breathe just fine without oxygen tanks, so it must have oxygen. Interesting. Anyways, welcome to episode two of Bring Ammo or Die Trying. This is basically the final gauntlet which involves you escorting your big Lego brick through the area while intermittently fighting off waves of enemies. I particularly enjoyed the big industrial tube that utilizes some form of blast processing to allow me to swirl around it like a protein shake mixing ball. After making it to the final stretch of this Mario Party minigame, this music happens. Eh, 
I'm sure that's nothing. The physics in this room are crazy though, as the boxes around the room take off like mimics when I go to stomp them. So this is kind of the final stretch, as I pilot the marker to its rightful location, the end of this tram rail. The music here is very dramatic, and tentacles writhe from the chasm below along with a load of necromorphs which won't stop coming. This is what Smash Mouth sang about. As the marker meets its final location, a beam of light shoots out of it, and Nicole comes out to tell Isaac that he's fucking insane. As he goes to leave, Kendra also comes out to tell Isaac that he's fucking insane. Using the advanced skills that only a technologist could harness, she presses a button and the marker automatically moves back to where I just manually dragged it around with my cool kinesis powers. Then she continues to emotionally kick Isaac in the balls by telling him to watch the entire recording that Nicole sent him from the very beginning of the game. So yeah, I guess the big twist was that Nicole is dead all along if you hadn't, um, figured that one out. I think the bigger twist here is that Kendra can apparently just kick ass from an escape pod on this hostile planet to get here in one piece to fuck over Isaac. And she moves really fast. I mean, Isaac has a shortcut back to the start of this thing and she's already got the marker back to the shuttle. Fortunately, the real hero of the game, this big fucking tentacle monster, comes in like a bolt of lightning. The final boss of the game is probably one of the easiest that you'll ever have to face down, as you really just need to blast, I believe, 10 glowing sacks before it biffs it. Then you hop on the shuttle and leave. That's the end. I know I've been praising the game pretty hard throughout it, but this ending kind of blows for a multitude of reasons. First off, all of the issues with Kendra just being able to gaslight Isaac into doing whatever she wants, then gatekeeping the marker away before girl bossing through the hostile necromorph-filled planet is fucking ridiculous no matter how you slice it. And for all of that setup, she just gets squished by the big monster anyway. I'd have taken a lot of alternatives to this, like her going crazy and deciding to merge with the necromorphs, like her piloting some kind of heavy mech to take on Isaac like her secretly being a master soldier who has some kind of suit that lets her exude expert control over kinesis and stasis. Anything else, really. Secondly, Isaac just leaves because the blast of energy from shutting down the marker caused it to destroy the gravity tethers that were holding up a meteor that was suspended over the planet. So the whole thing basically Vardenfell's Ages 7, which is a very clean ending. Now that might not seem like a lot in and of itself, but we again have to touch on what these markers are supposed to be. So again, skip to the time on screen if you want to avoid that. A lot of this critique is based off of where the devs decided to pivot towards with the whole marker scenario, and I know that that might not be the most fair basis of criticism, but I do think that it should be called into question specifically because of the remake coming around the bend. Basically, the markers should be thought of as an almost sentient life form. Actually, I'm pretty sure they are a sentient life form. The original back on Earth wanted to be copied and spread around, and so it infected human minds to get them to do just that. So this whole set of hallucinations with Nicole is more or less just the marker manipulating Isaac. But if you take that at face value, then that means that the marker did everything in its power to keep itself on the planet. But it also means that it didn't want to be placed back on the pedestal to be deactivated. Since it was made by humans, it can be shut off by using the pedestal and yet the vision of Nicole kept praising Isaac for bringing the marker to the pedestal, which then resulted in the meteor falling to the planet and presumably destroying the marker. Again, please feel free to correct me because this is some pretty difficult to navigate stuff. It's just messy no matter how you slice it, and again, a lot of this criticism should be noted more because of what the series became. When you take that away, the ending of this game is just pretty vanilla which isn't the worst thing for it to be because like I said at the start, the whole setup for this game was also pretty vanilla and I was okay with that. The issue I began to have as time went on was that the game began to ramp up the expectations a bit more for some solid twists. 
The whole Unitology idea and everything that it encompasses is fucking awesome, and it made me really want the devs to delve into that more. EarthGov showing up to meddle in the whole ordeal was also fun, and I liked the plot twist revolving around Kendra quite a lot. So you set up all of these expectations, and then you just kind of choose the middle road instead of fully committing to any of them. And it makes those twists have less impact when the game goes, uh, and then the meteor hits, uh, the end. Either way, at the end of the road, Isaac takes off his helmet to reveal that he has a human face, and then breathes a sigh of relief before his ghost girlfriend jump scares the shit out of him. I know that does have relevance in the next game, but god, that jump scare always felt like it was just there to hit the player with one last cheap fright before the credits roll. Overall, Dead Space is a fantastic entry into the horror genre. It does have a few bumps, but most of them feel small when compared to the overall themes, tone, level design, and pacing of the game. Let's start with the less than stellar stuff. So obviously there's the ending, which I'm not going to get into again. But more importantly, I still have that issue with Isaac being a silent protagonist. It's interesting because that was literally a design point when the developers laid out the plan for the game. Of course, this was walked back later, which made me wonder if they felt the same way that I did after starting to hammer out the story some more. The silent protagonist does work for a lot of this game. It helps you place yourself in the shoes of this seemingly modest engineer with the stomp of a god. But it doesn't really work when literally everyone just asks you to do things and then you just have to go do them. I think if you're going to have this silent character running around so that the player can fill in, then there has to be several avenues of choice that come with that decision. Instead, you just have to do anything that anyone tells you, be it Hammond, Kendra, Kine, or Nicole. It's a very bitter part of the game to swallow when you know what's going on with all of these characters, because you can't change a single thing about how you react as a player. I know that if you wanted to still go this route, then you'd have to rewrite a lot of the script to make it so that Isaac still winds up manipulated even when he chooses to go against the grain. But the easier route is to just give him a voice, which, again, does come later. I think the only other gripe that I really had was something that really wasn't much of one. And basically, it's that the game is pretty damn easy on the normal difficulty. I mean, I was almost always swimming in ammo and medkits, barring maybe one or two parts of the game. And often, the amount of power nodes that you can find and purchase by using your funds make upgrading your weaponry to do a large amount of damage easy as hell to pull off. I mean, I unintentionally died one time to fucking swarmers when they came out of a vent when I was passing by and wasn't paying attention. The final boss was also laughably easy. And despite just having sunk 10 nodes into my guns before the fight, I wound up pulling the pulse rifle for most of the battle, which is something that I didn't upgrade at all with those 10 nodes. Again, it's not really a huge complaint at all, but I do think that everything constantly dropping ammo and cash makes the game a walk in the park. Oh, and also, it's surprisingly short. My completion time while grabbing, I believe, every single node and exploring every single room was about 10 hours. And I think the only thing that really extends this playtime is playing scared and moving slowly. The next one isn't really a good or a bad and is more right down the middle. But basically, as I played through the game, a lot of my commentary wound up being, uh, yeah, this is broken, and this, and this, and, um, that, oh, and this too. Which you could point out as uninspired. But that's really only if you're expecting a grander story from this whole thing. And really, that grander story comes from the comics which came out before the game and the sequels that followed. Now, I'm sure that these guys could have shoved three or four more chapters that showed what was happening on the ship through the eyes of someone else. Uh, maybe every three chapters of Isaac's story, they interject a flashback. But I think I admire the focus here of what happened specifically with Isaac more. He's an engineer who's been sent to fix shit. And even if that has more than a few caveats attached, he does do exactly what he was sent to do here in a way. What's funny is that the creator of this game, Glenn Schofield, wanted it to be a sort of prison escape game initially. He wanted it to be on a derelict ship in space, which his team was on board with, but they all kind of questioned the prison escape idea. Ironically though, that's kind of what Dead Space became anyway. Sure, you're not a prisoner in a literal sense, but you're definitely one in a figurative sense. The whole thing is portioned out into a sort of, go fix this, now go over here, now do this. And about halfway through the game, your goal does become to escape. And if you focus on the game's story this way, it's really not that bad. It's only when you start thinking about the semantics of the marker and the like that the plot becomes a lot more muddled and messy. But let's talk about the good stuff. 
Dead Space does a fantastic job at rewarding exploration from area to area. By not being a bitch, you gain a ton more resources. Which might have been partially the reason that I was loaded with ammo and health packs for the majority of the game. But even when you don't look at the game as just resources to nab, a lot of the environmental storytelling is just stellar. It's not like every single room on the map just has enemies crammed into it. In fact, I'd say that 75% of the extra rooms don't have enemies at all. But they do have clues that make you think that there will be. Blood smeared all over a vent. Trails of gore leading from lockers and cabinets. Moody and broken lighting that prepares you for the worst. Even the game's medium or bigger events don't halt little scares from happening immediately before or after them. You get used to not feeling safe. Even in rooms that have safe stations or stores. You know those moments in Resident Evil where you make it to a safe room and you breathe a sigh of relief because you know that nothing can happen to you here? Yeah, Dead Space forgoes those safe moments at least one time per type of conventionally safe room. I've gotten jumped in a small room with just a safe station, a room with a store, an elevator, pretty much anywhere where things didn't happen for long enough to make me feel safe. It's a festival of emotional turmoil that continues to play with your feelings throughout the entire game, and I have to commend it for always keeping me at the edge of my seat. I think one of the coolest parts about Dead Space is how the player feels as time goes on. You start out just trying to survive. Everything makes you jump. You learn to stop trusting anything. You become really cautious. But then you gain a suit upgrade. And then some weapons. And another upgrade. And another. And before you know it, you are Isaac fucking Clark, and necromorphs should absolutely fear you. Yeah, the game is definitely still scary at times. Hell, the atmosphere is downright oppressive. Filled with the dread of wondering what's behind you. Of trying to figure out what might be around the corner. So yeah, the occasional necromorph is gonna get the jump on you and scare the piss out of you. But you're gonna shove them off and open them up like a pack of hot dogs before moving on to the next threat. In a lot of ways, it feels like you begin as an average human with incredible thunder thighs and stomping power and wind up becoming another iteration of the Doom Slayer. With incredible thunder thighs and stomping power, of course. It's actually kind of wild how much my mood would shift from I got this, nothing can stop me! to, oh fuck, this room is actually pretty creepy. And it really goes to show just how well these guys did when designing a game that treads between an action shooter in space and more traditional survival horror. But it's not just the upgrades, it's the player choice when it comes to said upgrades. You can very easily make it through this game with just your plasma cutter if that's what you feel like doing. Yes, you will struggle with certain enemy types, but you can do it. Some people are going to hate the pulse rifle. Some people are going to love the flamethrower. It's all a matter of what you like personally, but nearly any build is viable in Dead Space. It's rare to fire up a game and find yourself able to run with anything, for there to not be a meta. The game caters to everyone while rewarding those who want to strategize. I found myself pulling the force gun for tight corridors, but switching to the cutter or line gun when things opened up. If I was in an area where I thought I might be attacked by swarmers or something else small, I'd rock the pulse rifle. It just felt like I personally had an answer for most things and was able to reinforce myself with weaponry for specific situations. And that feels really good in a game that makes you feel like the odds are always against you, even if they technically might not be. I think the last thing that I want to say here about the good stuff is something that I very rarely talk about in my videos. The sound design. Yes, I've mentioned when there were good songs or soundtracks in video games, but there are very few songs in a traditional sense in Dead Space. And yet the audio for this game is absolutely magnificent. Every single bit of it, from random wrenches falling in the background to vents bursting open to the most horrible screeching and mechanical clunking of these broken down and busted bits of machinery. Good horror is built on sound design, and these guys 100% knew that going in. They didn't make it a lesser priority, and it shows in every possible way. Much like Left 4 Dead churned out specific sound cues to know which enemy might be creeping around the corner, Dead Space uses its own set of moans, burbling, and wailing from its necromorphs. If you pay attention to them, you're going to realize what's skittering around the corner and know which weapon to pull based off of that. It's an absolute marvel of sound engineering, and it really goes to show just how important this type of thing is for good horror. So is Dead Space as good as I remember? Absolutely. Despite the small gripes that I had with a plot that wasn't quite fully baked, the game is the pinnacle of what a horror game should be. It truly was a labor of love that was created by using some of the most innovative ideas that I've seen from the genre. 
This game really came at a time just before a lot of these studios were transformed into a more corporate machine that prioritized getting their games out in the simplest way possible for the least amount of money. I have seen what some of the remake is going to offer, and I'm extraordinarily excited to give it a spin when it drops. If it really does capture the intricacies and spirit of the original, I hope that sales shoot through the roof as a statement and testament to what games can and should be. Thanks for watching. This video was an absolute joy to make, and it really helped me to delve into a genre that I'm not fully used to covering. I'm really not sure how well it will do, all things considered, but I did have fun regardless. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to go for next, but I have been considering Dragon Age 2 for a while now. Might make for a good December video, though. Until then, I've got merch over at my merch shop. Included in that are these weird fabric coverings known as shirts, uh, odd drink holsters regarded as mugs, and strange sticky bits of paper called... stickers. You can pick yourself up a Deceased Sky shirt if you are a uh, fan of the game series. I've also got a Twitch where I stream nearly every Monday, Tuesday, and Friday. I've got a Twitter where I've been occasionally known to say a thing. I've got a Discord where people hang out and talk about topics. Many topics. And I've got a Patreon. And that's it. Have a good one.